Welcome to Great Debates, Power, Politics, and People. This month's topic, The Inadequacy of Science, Why Scientists Shouldn't Make Public Policy. With your panelists, Dr. Guy Crane, Professor of Philosophy at Rose State College. Dr. Amy Hurst, Professor of Life Science, Rose State College. Dan Ratcliffe, Professor of Environmental Science, Rose State College. And your moderator, James Davenport. Get the thumbs up. And is that me? All right. We are ready to go. Um, welcome to the second of our series uh, this fall for the Great Debate, Power, Politics, and People. Today we're going to be discussing the role and limits of science in creating public policy. Uh, and before we get started, I do want to uh, thank some folks for their support uh, of this series. Uh, first, thanks to our Social Sciences Division, uh, the Administration, uh, Dean Ortiz and Associate Dean Batchoffer, as well as our Division staff, which provide a great deal of logistical support for uh, pulling these off. Also, uh, very much thank you to Travis Hurst and Chris Meyer uh, for their assistance in uh, the technical end of this and arranging our facilities. Uh, and thanks to Greg Moore. I don't know, is Greg still here or did Greg leave? Greg Moore is the one who's providing, he's from McGraw Hill, he provides the pizza, so if you run into him sometime, be sure and tell him thank you for uh, graciously providing that uh, for us to make these a little bit uh, more enjoyable. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Tyler Bailey, who's our political science intern for this semester. Uh, and Tyler works closely with myself and Travis on helping to make sure that we can pull these events together. Uh, also, I want to thank um, the Institute for Humane Studies and the John Templeton Foundation. Uh, funding for these events has been provided from a grant from the Templeton Foundation uh, that's administered by the Institute for Humane Studies. And they've both been fantastic partners in this project, uh, and I want to make sure to thank them for their support of this effort. Now, let me introduce to you our distinguished, I can use that word, right? Our distinguished panelists. All right, I'll start uh, to my immediate left. Here is Dr. Amy Hurst. Dr. Hurst has been an instructor at Rose State College since 2006. She currently teaches sections of microbiology, introduction to biology, general biology, and biotechnology. In addition, Dr. Hurst is the coordinator of the life sciences department. Dr. Hurst earned her bachelor's degree and PhD from Oklahoma State University. Uh, while earning her doctorate, she completed research on estrogen receptors, presented her work at several conferences for the Society of the Study of Reproduction, and was published in Biology of Reproduction. Dr. Hurst has also performed postdoctoral research in protein biochemistry and was recently featured in a Fox 25 segment called How to Get Rid of Germs on Your Shoes. You can't. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Amy Hurst. <laughs> to my far left is Dr. Guy Crane. Uh, Dr. Guy Crane was born and raised here in, in, in Moore, Oklahoma. He earned his master's degree and PhD in philosophy from the University of Oklahoma. His dissertation focused on violence and interpersonal pacifism. Dr. Crane's research interests concern violence, pacifism, normative ethics, and the intersection of philosophy and cognitive psychology. Dr. Crane joined the full-time faculty of Rose State College in 2014, uh, and during the fall of 2014, uh, he and I collaborated on a revised political philosophy and political theory course, uh, which uh, we co-teach, and it's very entertaining and coming up in the spring, so all of you who need a course in the spring, you need to look us up. Uh, and uh, he recently completed a new textbook for his Introduction to Philosophy courses, and he earned the 2017 Excellence in Teaching Award from here at Rose State College. So please welcome Dr. Guy Crane. <laughs> to my right is Professor Daniel Ratcliffe. Uh, Mr. Ratcliffe has been a professor of environmental science at Rose State College for 15 years. In addition to his teaching duties, Professor Ratcliffe is also the program coordinator for the environmental science degree program. In this capacity has grown the program considerably, 
Uh, in addition to his uh, role as an educator, he also owns a successful environmental consulting firm. Uh, and his work consists of wetlands delineation, stream surveys, environmental audits, stormwater permits, and presence or absence of surveys for the endangered American burying beetle. Did I say that right? You did. All right. Uh, Professor Ratcliffe earned his bachelor's degree in wildlife and fisheries ecology and his master's degree in environmental science from Oklahoma State University. Go Pubs. <laughs> Professor Ratcliffe has been in the United States Army Reserve for the last 22 years. He currently teaches the military history course of the ROTC cadets at the University of Central Oklahoma. And during a 2008-2009 deployment with Operation Iraqi Freedom, he worked as a combat advisor for the Iraqi Infantry Officer School in Kirkush, Iraq. Please welcome Professor Daniel Ratcliffe. Now let's get into today's topic. All right. And I'm going to start this off with some comments and then this will kind of be a free flow from there uh, in which some of these other panelists uh, explain to you why I don't know what I'm talking about. So uh, this should be fun. Uh, it's always enjoyable to get beat up by people much smarter than you uh, in public. So we will see how that goes. All right. Whether it's the environment or nutrition, cancer research or genetically modified organisms, Science is at the forefront of our discussions, with all sides claiming to speak for it. But how much influence should science have in the creation of public policy on these issues? How effective is the scientific method in guiding the decisions we make through governmental officials and institutions on behalf of society? And is there a limit to the appropriateness of the scientific method when it comes to determining the actions we make legal or illegal for millions of people? Here's the issue. We love science. You point out any recent scientific report or discovery and we think it's fantastic. We want to base everything on science, not just decisions about how to protect our natural environment or combat breast cancer or build better cars and airplanes, but we want it to tell us how to educate our children, improve our love lives, and invest our money. We're amazed that humanity actually survived before the dawn of the scientific age. More importantly, especially for today's conversation, many don't realize that there might actually be limits to what science can tell us or its ability to inform our decisions on a wide range of subjects. We blithely assume that if someone in a white lab coat and protective goggles says it, it must be true and it must be science. So let's start at the beginning. Science is a method for obtaining knowledge. This method contains several steps, making observations, developing questions, developing hypotheses, creating testable predictions, gathering the data to test those predictions, and reporting our findings. Two other aspects of this methodology are also important. Uh, and one is that as the data is gathered and we um, look at it, it's a possible and appropriate to refine, modify, or even reject our initial hypotheses based on what we've learned. Also, in order to become accepted, the research should be replicable. In other words, if someone else came along and followed our process, they should reach the same results or conclusions as we did. This process is nice and neat when making observations in a laboratory or when observing natural phenomena. It can be quite useful in telling us if this new auto design will be more or less safe or whether the surface temperature of the globe has been warming over a specific period of time or what will happen to our bodies if we consume too much alcohol. But explaining how these things occur is much different than explaining what should be done through public policy based on this information. Government is not a natural phenomenon that can be easily observed. At its most fundamental level, government is a method used to make decisions for society. Government is a result of human interaction and behavior. And science's ability to give us direction on what decisions we should make regarding the natural observable phenomenon it reveals to us is not clearly as cut. Equally important, the very nature of science should motivate us to be cautious 
and attempting to rely solely on it to make important decisions regarding the types of activities and decisions we, through governmental processes, restrict people from making. Science is a method of discovery, but it is rarely settled as some would like you to believe. To quote Marcus Wu in a 2015 article for Wild Ma Wired Magazine, but scientists are wrong all the time, and that's okay. In fact, it's great. When a researcher gets proved wrong, that means the scientific method is working. In addition, in a 2005 article published in the scientific journal PLOS Medicine, researcher John Ioannidis finds that it is more likely for a research claim to be false than true. And even employing the recommendations Dr. Ioannidis in his article makes, he concludes it is impossible to know with 100% certainty what the truth is in any research question. If it was, it wouldn't be science. We see this play out in research on nutrition, medicine, and more. What we thought we knew 30 years ago was incomplete or simply wrong. As we learn more, we discover by consistently applying the scientific method new insights into matters that we once thought we knew everything about. It also needs to be acknowledged that science, or at least the reporting of scientific research, has been one of the biggest scaremongers and fear drivers about the future, we have, that, about the future that we have seen. Our culture constantly distorts and disfigures science, both in entertainment media and in news reporting, in order to sensationalize findings that are much more cautious or conditional than how they are presented, or to generate concern about future consequences if some condition isn't addressed right now. From Thomas Malthus' fears of overpopulation, which never materialized, especially uh, but we hear constantly about even today, uh, especially in entertainment media, to biologist Paul Ehrlich's lost wager with economist Julian Silent over the increased scarcity of certain natural resources, to the media fascination with a new ice age in the decade of the 70s, it's clear that while scientists themselves tend to be rather hesitant to draw dramatic conclusions about their work, the media and the general public, whose understanding of science is admittedly relatively low, are not so cautious. Finally, when making decisions regarding human interactions, science cannot be and should not be the only consideration, nor necessarily the only means by which we obtain knowledge to inform these decisions. Distinguished thinkers from the British statesman Edmund Burke through the 20th century economist Friedrich Hayek and modern economic historian Deidre McCloskey have all recognized there are other means of gaining and transmitting knowledge within society besides the scientific method. Culture, tradition, religion, philosophy, all inform human thinking and provide insights into human nature and interaction. To completely abandon these solely for the pursuit of science amounts to what Hayek described as a type of worship of science, one that creates an imbalance in human understanding and knowledge. Should science inform our public policies on a variety of matters? Absolutely it should. Should it be the only or even the dominant influence on the majority of these policies? I would argue probably not. And in a democratic system, it cannot be. The nature of democracy demands that a variety of perspectives and methods for obtaining human knowledge must be allowed, and therefore that this variety is a good in itself, for it enhances human knowledge and human understanding. I'm done. Let the fireworks begin. Who wants to go? I'll go. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually sympathetic to a lot of what you say. I don't think that uh, it's impossible for any given instance, say, of scientific information to inform public policy, but I think that there are, some of which you've hinted at, uh, major obstacles to the practice of allowing science to mm, even if we just say guide, and not a stronger word like govern, public policy. So one is, as you say, there might be other things that we value, not just modes of knowledge, let's say, but there might be other values that we think ought to be protected, even uh, when, say, commitment to those values might, 
might conflict with commitment to certain scientific sorts of findings or something like that. So here I'm thinking about the way that uh, scientific findings might conflict with a value, say, like liberty or individual freedom or something like that. So, uh, so here's a question. Should a person be free to hold and perhaps even act on beliefs that are false according to our best current data or something like that? Um, I think just recently, in fact, it was the state of California that banned the, the sale of, um, oh, the, I forgot the terms that they use for it, but like uh, if a person felt uh, homosexual attraction, they could go ask this person to like convert them out of that or something like that. And so California said, you know, no, you can't be doing that anymore, particularly the law concerned minors. But it raises the question then like, so... Even if that's the, look, I think, yeah, that's probably right. It's probably snake oil, okay? But even if that's the case, right, should it, should we say as a society a person's just not allowed, right, to act on the belief that, look, I want that, even if everybody in a white lab coat is telling me that this is snake oil, I don't care. I'd rather try it. And the state of California says, we don't care. You can't do that. And so here's a case where, like, yeah, our current best science says this, and in that very vein, then, we're not going to allow individuals to act on it, even if they disagree with it or something like that. So there's this potential conflict between, say, uh, ways in which we want individuals to have options before them and our best scientific findings about, uh, about which, if true, might limit what those, we think those options should be. That's one. I think a much bigger one, though, is scientific findings vis-a-vis -vis sort of um, public receptivity and even literacy about scientific findings, right? So it's, it's nice to think that, you know, our current best science should, like, inform what we should do or what our policies are, but part and parcel of what our policies will be will be some part of the democratic process, which means as long as scientific claims attempt to be part of that process, then whether or not those claims are true are, are, is going to be up for debate, even among persons without any relevant expertise or training in that field. And it's nice to think that, like, oh, well, you know, we'll have people that just have the relevant, you know, literacy, we'll make sure they do, or something like that. It's not, I, I, I see that as unrealistic for lots of reasons. So one major one is brought up by, um, Naomi Oreskes, who's a history of science professor at Harvard, and she points that out that like even scientists themselves outside their field are kind of just trusting each other. So a geologist as such can't tell you, say, like what causes breast cancer or whether a vaccine is safe. And so even in cases of having the expertise and the training, that person has to sort of make a leap of faith and just say, like, here's what the experts say. And much is, you know, much the same is true for like me when I mean I don't have any of that relevant training or anything like that. So if and when there's uh, scientific claims being made, if they turn out to be true, I'm just going to be taking their word for it. And Oreskes argues that is what we have to do. That what we should be trusting is scientific consensus. And if she's right about that, uh, I mean, uh, her point is con the consensus of the scientific community means that there's been this like rigorous organized skepticism and peer review and testing and things like that. Okay. But what that means is if she's right, then ultimately we have a massive panel of experts, and I'm just going to defer or not defer in those cases. And that's kind of scary in some ways because we like to think of democracy as, but wait a minute, um, I'm going to decide for myself here. I'm not just going to like let you tell me how things go. And that sort of opening up to the public of like, well, tell us, you know, do you think the experts are right or not? Uh, can frankly work on our psychology and create sort of all kinds of um, in-group, out-group mentalities. Now we have, you know, we don't have like scientists. Now we have citizens who are going to like, you know, self-nominate to be on team science or something like that. And I, you know, again, the, well, the lab coat folks say this, so clearly you're wrong or something like that. Look, there are other folks that are really concerned about this. So there's this professor of law and philosophy at University of Miami, Susan Hack, who says, who, who would agree, like, look, science should inform some of our decision making here, but there's a worry about, like, scientism, when the word scientific can become sort of, um, you know, like a, a magic spell for must be true, right, or, or scientific just means awesome and right, and if you don't think so, you're crazy or something like that. Uh, that can become um, a borderline sort of, like, cult following rather than science itself and something worth avoiding. Now, it's, it's easy to say, see, that's exactly why what we need is, you know, more 
science education, the average citizen should have been exposed to this kind of thing. Uh, I'm skeptical of that too because, I mean, our current best science says that we aren't good at responding to facts. In fact, we're really, really terrible at responding to facts. Uh, so in psychology, uh, around several studies has developed what's come to be called the backfire effect. And in a variety of ways, people have been subjected to uh, conditions where they're given false information deliberately and allowed to process that, then later on given correcting information. Here, here's the articles that disagree with that. And what we find is the majority of people, majority of the time, when confronted with the facts, with the true information, that actually galvanizes their prior belief. And uh, in some cases, the studies were like deliberately fabricated articles about something, and then they were given actual articles, and they still thought the deliberately fabricated one had to be right, even after reading the new ones. Uh, in other cases, it's scarier than that. So in another study, um, t people were given uh, fabricated scientific studies uh, based on what their prior beliefs were about. So in this study, it was about uh, beliefs about homosexuality. So if a person s reported their prior beliefs to be like, I'm very in support of this, uh, they would be given utterly fabricated material about how like here's several lab studies that actually shows it's really harmful. And if they reported the opposite, they said like, I'm very opposed to that, then they would be given fabricated lab studies, about, oh, it's actually, there's nothing wrong with it. And in both sets of folks, what the result was is that um, the studies disagreeing with their prior beliefs actually caused them to have less faith in the scientific method, not less faith in their prior beliefs about homosexuality. And so there's, and th this could double back up on itself. If there's a backfire effect, there can easily be a backfire backfire effect, right? If I am, uh, if I'm already psychologically hardwired to sort of like dig my heels in when I'm presented with counter evidence, then the person who look out of every good intention of their heart wants to sort of like educate me as, as you know, Joe Public about science, their psychology is a piece in this puzzle too. And now all of a sudden like, no, dang it, team science. And now we have team science and team anti-science who have to fight this out. And the sad part of that is as soon as it's politicized to that point, we don't have anybody really talking about science at all, properly speaking. We just have people who have new rhetoric to like sling mud at each other, that kind of thing. Um, but my bigger skepticisms about this, I, I mean, as much of a mess as that is, I think that um, even under ideal circumstances where we could straighten out our psychologies, we could prioritize our values, look, there still would be like hard calls to make about the way that science might inform public policy. So suppose all the psychology was sorted out. We still have to make this hard call about like what constitutes um, sufficient scientific evidence for policy rewriting reasons, right? Is it X number of studies? Is it X number of replications? Is it scientific consensus? Okay, at what percentage of sci you know, scientific agreement do, are we gonna consider like the policy threshold for scientific consensus, that kind of thing? And it seems like in any of those cases, look, we're gonna just start throwing darts and some of that's gonna be arbitrary. Right? If you want to say, like, okay, 95% of scientists working in the field agreeing, that's consensus. Well, why not 94? Right? Why not 93? What is that magic? What's, what's doing the work of making 95 so magic? And yet we would need to make some call like that. If we want to say, like, oh, it's not like that. I mean, this is a case-by-case -case basis. That is just to say it's so messy we can't have a practice about that. Uh, and again, that means we'll be maybe flying blind each time or something like that. Now, that's not to say that there isn't challenges there, too. Even if we were just talking about internal concerns, there are internal concerns within science about it guiding our policy-making procedures. So if uh, I want to do a study, that might entail needing tons and tons of survey data. And it, I might not have the, the time or the manpower or whatever to get that kind of information. So, you know, maybe I have the grant money to hire out a company to do that data collecting for me. Utterly unbeknownst to me, for all I know, that data collecting company might be partially funded by some special interest group, by a lobbying group, and they're the ones that are going to handle my raw data and hand it back to me. And that's kind of scary, because now I don't have sort of like the lovely sample that I thought I had. So those kinds of concerns on top of things like the pressures to, um, to get results, you know, that, that you're, if you're a scientist in the field, you need to be publishing papers, and it just so happens that journals are not going to be thrilled to publish your 
uh, paper, the conclusion of which is nothing interesting happened when I did this. Uh, there's tremendous pressure to have results. And so there's all kinds of ways in which, frankly, I mean, those things can be tweaked uh, to make it seem like there's a more significant effect than it is, even for people who have the best of intentions to avoid such things. And that's the kind of thing that, like, even would need policing. Even if all the rest were sorted out, it seems like these internal institutional sorts of challenges are also going to be an obstacle. I'm not saying any of that to say it can't be done. I'm saying, like, there's no clear path that is not messy as it could be uh, for at least those three reasons. Who's up? Okay. I'm going to give you a mic. I'm okay. pretty sure I'm a little I bit further back, so. should have been holding one when I was doing mine. So. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm sure if I'm too loud, I'll get some kind of hand signal <laughs> to back it off. Um, I think there's a lot of things to unpack on, on both sides. Uh, one of the things in, in preparing for this, I was kind of thinking, oh, my gosh, we spend whole semesters trying to get people to understand a little bit of science. <laughs> it's like, I've got 15 minutes. Um, that's not going to happen. Um, but, but I think some of the things, it, science is a methodology, but it's also around us. So whether, so whether we're talking about um, you know, perception, because a lot of things are perception. I, I like the, the example of the white lab coat, because I see that. They'll, tout someone out on the uh, on the news who's got a white lab coat on like oh I'll just get eye rolls like that doesn't mean anything people using the trappings of science um, to try to sell something is, is annoying but that doesn't change what science actually is which is natural phenomenon around us and there are lots of subdisciplines of science um, which makes it a little bit you were kind of talking about that also with the um, you know Geologist is just going to kind of you know, go, okay, that, that biomedical person can answer that question better. Um, but I think you have to start somewhere because those, these are, are the things that are happening around us. And, and as a biomedical person, I kind of default back to um, what kills people? <laughs> like, how many people have to die before uh, we change a policy? And a lot of examples that, that can tie back to this are things like um, the TB plagues in the early 1900s before we didn't understand as well uh, about how infectious agents work and one in seven people were dying from TB. Um, one of the funny things about that is today people are like, oh, kids back in the old days, they always behaved so much better. Well, it's because actually the research has shown that they were taught to behave better because their parents were probably going to die from TB. Um, one in seven people died. It was pretty likely someone in your family was going to die. And when you were left as an orphan, if you didn't behave real nice, your neighbors weren't going to take you in. And you're going to get sent down to the orphanage. But if you were a really polite, sweet kid when your parents died from TB, your neighbors might take you in and, and take care of you. Um, then we figured out that TB was caused by infectious agents and that these could be prevented by things like hand washing and um, covering that cough and we were able to decrease the number of deaths from TB. We were able to develop antibiotics. We were able to um, have better health and human lifespan has increased because of that. Um, infant mortality has decreased because of that. and. You know, do, people do want to have their own kind of, well, if I don't want to have to, to wash my hands after I go to the bathroom and then go out and cook food, why should I have to wash my hands? It, 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 there should be policy that, that if you're working in food safety, you, or if you're working with food, you, you wash your hands. And that should be governed. And it's like, well, if 95% of scientists agree that you should wash your hands, what about those five who don't? It's like, no, wash your hands. Um, cover your cough. Uh, th these things that we do in science, there is a lot of complexity. And I, I do agree that one of the problems that comes up is people want an easy answer. They want a magic bullet. They want, why don't we have a cure for cancer? Like, do you know how complex cancer is? <laughs> there, there's not a magic bullet, but then people get frustrated. Like, well, how am I going to make policy if there's not a magic bullet answer? It's like, well, you have to start somewhere. You, you have to be bold enough and brave enough 
to, to stand and say, hey, we, you know, this, this automobile design results in um, cars exploding when they get in a low speed accident, <laughs> like a five mile per hour rear end accident and the car explodes. What should we do about that? Do we need to have a committee about that? Um, and and instead, in, all, in all reality, there, there was. You know, it took lawsuits and it took suing and it took us like, what should we do? It's like, but, but it should have been an easy answer. It's like, people are dying. Stop making that car. Um, or change the design of that car. But so many things do come down to, to money and politics and who's funding the study and, and it becomes very complex. But I guess in my happy science brain, it shouldn't be complex. Like people die, stop doing that. Um, and one of the problems, perceived problems, is that science does move kind of slowly and, and time is a weird thing. Um, it's, we, we view time through this little narrow wind, this little narrow window of 100 years, which actually is nothing. Um, and that's if you're lucky, you'll get to see 100 years. Um, now you're much more likely to see 100 years today than back in 1900. Then you were only going to see probably maybe like 30 or 40 years. And, and so we're like, well, it, it takes so long to really know how something's going to happen. Should we make policy about that? But if we don't, we might mess up stuff so badly that our descendants in a thousand years, are just, there's just not any. You know, and, and, and you have to make some hard decisions. I, I think one of the really kind of interesting um, cases and there's lots of cases out there. It's like, which one do you pick? Uh, there's a researcher named Claire Patterson. It's a guy um, back in the 1960s, and he was actually uh, had been given a project, had been given a meteorite. So, you know, see how old this meteorite is. See how how um, how old the universe might be, and all these other kind of complex questions. And they were using lead to date how old this meteorite was. And he kept getting all this background noise. He actually, Claire Patterson invented clean rooms. We think about clean rooms today, and that's because of Claire Patterson because he got all this background lead noise in the 1940s and 50s and 60s when he was doing this research. He's like, where is this lead coming from? Anyone, anyone? Well, paint, food cans, uh, pencils a little bit. There's even a bigger one that got, it wasn't really, um, outlawed until like the late 1970s, early 1980s. Well, a little bit. Those are still those are still out there. Uh, go to Flint, Michigan. Still a problem. Um, what, what about when you go to put gas in your car, car? What does it say on the? It says it's unleaded now. That's because there used to be lead in the gas, and it would burn, and then there was lead in the air, and and it was background. It was everywhere. But a lot of the corporations, the get the, the companies that made gasoline, they didn't want to have to take that out. Car designers didn't want to have to change how the catalytic converters worked. They didn't want to have to do that. It was going to be expensive. It was going to be messy. It's like, well, let's make a committee on this. And who was on the committee? The committees were made of people who were in the gas and the car businesses. And um, Patterson actually had to really fight. He lost contracts. He lost jobs. He lost grants because he was like, we are going to kill people. And they're like, well, but the average lead level is this in people now. And he actually went and got samples from mummies and fossils. He's like, no, lead levels have not always been this high. This is a last, you know, like 30 years kind of event. This is bad. Um, but he put it all on the line out there, and, and it didn't change quickly. But eventually they, they outlawed lead and gas and paint and um, cans food cans, used to have lead in them, yeah, that, that can tuna wasn't so good for you. And since 1990, um, comparing to like the 1984, 82, lead levels in human blood samples has dropped by 80%. Um, but but our, I would argue it took way too long um, to, to get that changed. And so I think, you know, like what's the threshold, like people dying is the, is the threshold, you know, and, and it shouldn't have to be like, well, it's going to take 20 years because in 20 years you've lost a generation to neurological defects because of, of lead poisoning. Um, so I'm, I'm like a, uh, you know, that, that's my threshold and science can answer a lot of those questions. So I think that science should be, obviously you have to be cautious with anything and, and you're not always going to be a hundred percent, let's a hundred percent do it this way. 
but but I think science has to be pretty huge in that that policy discussion. Yes, I think maybe it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing that science is a little bit more like, oh, we can change. We can change if there's better evidence. We can do that. Um, but then there's this public perception, this public pushback. Well, like, they're not in 100% agreement. Like, but that's science. That's science. Um, so I, I think there are perception issues for sure. Um, but I, I, from, a, from a biomedical standpoint, my, my threshold is always, um, as far as limits, is we shouldn't let people die. And we shouldn't allow, just because of economy or money or you know what, what's going to get someone elected next year, um, let that be what governs policy where we could already be changing the environment or, or changing human health or impacting something to the extent if these things are, are slow processes, it might get to a threshold, to a tipping point where we can't fix it. And so maybe Malthus was, was wrong on how fast overpopulation was going to happen. You know, he thought it was going to happen a lot sooner. But do you really want to get to the point where we're overpopulated? And now there's a lot of people dying, you know, because it's hard to step back from that line. Once you cross that line, you can't correct that ship real fast. Um, I know we've got the, the Titanical, the musical coming up pretty soon here on campus. And I'd say I could like, visualize the planet as the Titanic. If there's an iceberg coming and you can't turn it fast enough, a lot of us are going to die. Uh, and that's it's not, a, it's not a good thing. Um, so I think science, which can answer these questions about how the world works around us, how natural phenomenon occurs, has to be really central, really central in those discussions for public health and, and well-being. So. That's, that's my take on it. Hi, Professor Ratcliffe, yes. I'll let you take it. All right, whenever I was first asked, is this coming out anymore? Yeah. Whenever I was first asked to participate in this debate, it was framed to me, or it was, the information was conveyed to me that the social science department, that's correct, right? <laughs> Well, is one of us okay <laughs> business department no no, no, no social no. science no, all no. right social <laughs> science but okay all right social science department uh wants to have this debate about how science should not be incorporated in developing policy and i was like what that's ridiculous i was like that's a slam dunk of course i'll i'll agree well i reluct reluctantly agreed to participate on the panel and then I read the email, and then I uh, I read James's uh, your your description or your right. your statement about that, and it's like okay, well, science should should be included, but it shouldn't be the only baseline. And I have to I have to say I agreed with the majority of your statement there. So uh, that's not good. I mean, we <laughs> I mean so so yeah, that's I I want to. I want to frame it of like since this is supposed to be a, a debate in the spirit of a debate, I want to frame it like so I have some opposition against the, uh, James's and Guy's viewpoint, but Guy seemed to agree with me as well. So, all right. So, uh, from what I understand, is that science should not be included as all as everything on developing policy. So, let me ask you a question. What? What is the driving force on developing policy? What, what is the main thing where we develop policy from? What's the main issue? Well, it depends on the issue, right? Okay, so in blankly, let's just say. As far as what's the main... What, what, uh, how do we, what criteria do we use to develop policy? Again, I would say that depends on the policy issue, what the main criteria would be. If we're talking okay. policy related to um, a clean environment, mm -hmm. then science certainly would be a driver in that. And right? it should be the main. And one would the, think. Yeah. A, a very important piece of okay. it, right? So I would, I would argue that right now, currently, the main, uh, the main driving force for developing policy is not science. It's economics. It's where the money is. Because you can ask a question and like, okay, well, what's the problem? What are we going to do about this? And, and you always, it always boils down to money. We have the money to fix it. And so I would say that on, if, whenever I'm framing my argument against the social science department argument, then I would say that 
we need to have science as the core to develop policy. I agree, policy should be forged and developed by understanding issues of science, ethics, and economics. But I would also argue that science needs to be the basis of this because it needs to be the core, it needs to be the fundamental. Because of science, then we, we identify what the problems are, one, and then we also develop an understanding of these complicated issues and then also solutions. So let's, let's take the economics out of it, let's take the ethics out of it, and let's just boil down the science. And then, of course, whenever we develop the policy, we have to put those back in. So I don't know, uh, can you agree that we can have this debate with you saying that science should be a part of it, but not the core? And then I, I agree that science should be the core. We can, we can kind of start out there. I'm, okay. I'm fine with that. Is that okay? Sure. All sure. right. All right. I do have one question of uh, Dr. Hurst. This might be kind of inflammatory, but I'm going to throw it out here anyway, which is how many deaths are too many? Um. And I ask, uh, I ask this because uh, just watching TV, drug advertisement comes on. Take this drug, it'll solve whatever this problem, and then they run me through the list of things that might be harmful to me by taking this drug. The last one is always, and death. So obviously, somebody thinks that a certain amount of death resulting from the product of science, certainly, we, I don't think anybody would argue that these, these products aren't developed in a laboratory somewhere by scientists, right? So to what extent is how many deaths are too many? And how do we make that determination? I, I think that's kind of getting to, to Dan's frame as well, is that you know you start with the science as as the core, where you say, is 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 TB preventable? Is death from salmonella preventable? Is death from measles preventable? You know, and, and we can predict if I give do X Y Z things because of science. I can predict that okay, if I do X Y Z things, then people don't necessarily have to die from measles. They don't necessarily have to die from TB. They don't necessarily have to die from lead poisoning. They don't have to necessarily die from an auto accident. Um, and then you have to you do have to bring the ethics and the the economy back into it after you've said okay, I can prevent death. Um, and, and there's always, then you get into the ethics questions, like how, how many deaths are permittable. Um, and I think it also, it's not necessarily like, okay, there are five deaths are okay, five, seven deaths are okay, but it's a percentage of the population. Um, so if I do not treat this infectious agent, there is a 20% chance, or there's a chance that 20% of the population is gonna die. Um, but if I'm able to give them this preventative treatment, then there's a risk that 0.5% of the population might have an adverse reaction to that. And then you have to balance. Like, is it, is it worth saving 20% of the population for the risk of 0.5% having ad, an adverse reaction? Now that's, and, and I, I, oh my gosh, those commercials. I feel you on those. <laughs> because a lot of them are things, and, and, and I guess between comfort level and between you know, quality of life and actually like, dying. Um, so some things, and it's gotten, and that goes back to the economy though also, because I remember, okay, I'm gonna date myself here. <laughs> Like, how old is she? I remember when you didn't have drug commercials on TV all the time. Like, growing up, I don't remember those because it used to be regulated. Like, you couldn't advertise like that. And then it was deregulated, and now you have a lot of commercials, a marketing piece of it, where, like, how much restless leg syndrome drug can I sell? How much uh, dry eye treatment can I sell? How much? And, and then they, they market it to people, like, is your leg twitching? Might be able to take care of that for you, uh, but I, I would argue that's not science. I mean, there's science involved in there, but that's not. Um, that's a lot more marketing. That's where science has been taken from the core, and, and economy has replaced the core on that one. Can, can I answer the question? Yeah, Dan, go for it. I would say zero, but you have to err on the side of caution. You have to 
Uh, the EPA, CDC, and the Federal Drug Administration, they say that everybody weighs 70 kilograms, which is 154 pounds. Everybody also lives 70 years. What is an acceptable risk? Because we have to, everything that we do out there is, is risky. Driving is risky, flying is risky, driving is more risky than flying. And so you have a group of people that are sensitive, they are going to be more sensitive, that aren't going to be protected to the standard. But we have to have some sort of standard that we base that on science. So they say an acceptable risk, by the way, is a, uh, one in a million chance. So we try to abate that risk to a lower percentage. So we're saying that it's uh, like uh, atrazine, a safe level of atrazine, according to the EPA and the CDC and the, well, it's the EPA, uh, they say it's three parts per billion. But people have, uh, Tyrone Hayes has done studies with frogs, and he has found that they, uh, he exposes them to a tenth of a part per billion. So 0 0.1 PPB, and he finds, he has found sexual abnormalities with the frogs that he exposes them to. So that's a frog. This is lab studies, and this is science. So we're trying to determine from a frog that has a physiological difference than a human being of what an acceptable limit would be to us. So this is where the, they, they uh, extrapolate the data and they come up with what is an acceptable limit. I mean, is there errors in that? Yeah, there, there is. And are there going to be, are we going to protect to a level that is going to protect everybody? It's impossible to do. So what do we need to base that on? We don't need to base that on how much money it's going to cost, which is being done right now in policy. We need to base that on science, science-based policy. That's what I'm advocating. Do you have a question? Do you, do you want to throw it here? Or, uh, go ahead. You sure? I'll, I'll keep it. <laughs> Push it way down. <laughs> um, all right. So I think, and, and I, w I almost wish I had one of our economics faculty on here because I don't want to uh, uh, don't want to go too far afield here, but. Uh, when we talk about the economics driving it, the economics is simply a recognition that uh, we don't have the resources to do everything, right? Yes, if we devoted 100% of our resources into curing cancer, we might be able to get there sooner than we can now. But that curing cancer isn't the only problem we have. Uh, we, devote we have to re devote resources to auto safety. We have to devote resources to um, protecting the environment. We have to devote resources to other issues. And so, um, you know, the economics of this is largely driven by we have a lack of resources and a lot of demands. Uh, and so now we have to choose which of these are we going to move forward on first and why. And when we say, well, we're going to let science drive that, I don't know that science can drive that. That's a question about human priorities. That's a question about what do we think is most important to solve right now. Not necessarily a question I think that science is well suited to answer in and of itself. Um, and, uh, and so I, you know, from my perspective, uh, science has to come to some recognition that we can't devote 100% of our resource to every single priority, uh, even if we have plenty of science that says this is important to do. Uh, we've got to pick and choose based on the real reality of a scarcity of resources to devote to these things. And choosing among priorities doesn't always come down, and in a democratic process, it cannot come down to simply following, well, here's what the scientific conclusion comes, because you have other interests involved. Uh, and when we talk about competing interests involved, uh, I think we, we do a disservice to this discussion if we immediately assume that any competing interest is automatically lesser than or in some way uh, uh, harmful simply because it's a different interest. So uh, I'm going to start there. This crowd is. Um, I don't know how much off topic this is, but uh, one of the things that, that you mentioned kind of struck me because this, this weekend I actually had the ability to um, 
we traveled to the to the east coast and i got to go to the um the smithsonian institute and, and actually we went through the, the holocaust museum and it, it made me think um humans are horrible <laughs> I, i'm just gonna like my my thing i took away from that is, is, is humans are pretty bad um and that's you know i and this is my science brain um that's why you're know, like well there's human interests and human but humans are horrible <laughs> we're, we're not we don't always do things you know we we have preconceived notions we have background and philosophies and all these other things um, a lot of tribalism and, and I think when we let well human nature and you know hu humans what they think they need the most of um, let's let's let that drive the the boat well I, I know I've talked to people and they're like well I they've honestly said um, I care more about what happens in the economy in the next hundred years and how cheap it is for me to drive my car than than whether you know the, the earth is, habit, is, is habitable in a thousand years. I just don't care. I care about how cheap my, ja my gas is this week. And it's just like, oh. <laughs> and, and so I, I know it's impossible. It's my impossible dream it is that the science is the core. Like, I, I don't care what you think. I don't care if you hate these people because they have, you know, a different level of, of, of melanin or they have different resources or that. That is not a reason. That is a horrible reason. Science says, you know, we are 99.99% are the same. We're all the same. So these other human things that come into it that we want to create, well, those people, these people, that people, da 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 da. Well, these people deserve more resources and those people do. Like, ugh. I just want science to be the core, which says that we're all very similar and we need a planet that's habitable. Um, and we need food and we need clean drinking water and we need shelter and those things help us to survive. Um, it does get a lot more messy than that. I, I know it does, but in my perfect little science brain, I'm like, it shouldn't have to be. It, it shouldn't, if we really did just go, let's look at the science, it shouldn't be as complex as a problem as it is. I know it does because because I know it, it gets messy, but in my science brain, it shouldn't be messy because it's not, I mean, there's, we, we've got to survive. Uh, so that should form the policy for, first, that should be the core, and then we're like, okay, you know, let, let's see how we can uh, economize that, but is that gonna change anytime soon? Sadly, probably not in my lifetime, but, but I can dream, a girl can dream, so. <laughs> okay, a lot of time, then the short-term gain is outweighed in economic decisions over a long-term benefit or long-term cost. Because these environmental problems, and I, I always look at this instead of a social science uh, viewpoint or lens, I look at it as an environmental science lens because environmental science is the most important <laughs> subject in the world today. And you guys should all take the intro to environmental science class and then maybe you want to change your major to environmental science. Sorry, I had to put a plug in for, for my program. Uh, I think everyone's done it. So Amy mentioned lead in the environment. We took lead out of gasoline. We just phased that out. And uh, all of the problems that scientists were having with trying to get that out because of short-term interest by industry. We have, we have gained the benefit of hundreds of billions of dollars by having unleaded gasoline and not having lead particulate matter over millions of miles over our road from lead in gasoline. So we have, we have benefit long-term health benefits. Our children, our uh, higher IQs, uh, better productivity, better environment. We used to have rivers that caught fire here. The Cuyahoga River caught fire, I believe, up in Ohio 13 times. And this was fr from lack of science-based policy. So now we have science-based policy, which I believe should be the core, and uh, we, we live better, we live longer. Uh, life expectancy, Dr. Hirsch mentioned life expectancy. In the 1950s, world life expectancy was in the mid-40s. And today, world life expectancy is almost 70 years. And that is because of, we have done a better job with nutrition, which is science. We have done a better job with technology, which is science. Science has made this world a much better place. We have cell phones, we have energy, we have 
automobiles that we have planes we can fly over and we can we can see other countries we have medicine we have better nutrition we, we are able to feed the world which is 7.4 billion people because of science because of the green revolution because of technology and these these policies that we implemented should not be based on just economics because we have long-term benefits that is often overlooked by economists I'm not saying that we should ignore economics because we always ask the question how the heck are we going to pay for this? And that's a huge question. And it has to be, it, it has to be evaluated because, our, our, yeah, we, we should uh, get rid of all the greenhouse gases. Uh, we should cut out uh, burning coal. We should cut out burning natural gas. And we go to purely electric cars. Well, on renewable energy, that is a huge cost. We don't have the money for it right now. But we can take small steps to advocate that and we can use our political clout to vote for politicians that will also advocate and develop these uh, renewable in, uh, renewable energy alternatives so that's my plug okay. you want to say something before we uh, yeah, right. throw it open to I okay I don't know that I've heard anything I necessarily disagree with. I'm still waiting for the debate to start. Um, <laughs> I don't feel like anything can't, I said has been... just be like, it's all cool. Uh, I would say, look, suppose we, suppose we had our ideal. Suppose we had some wonderfully pristine committee of scientists who were not infiltrated by special interest or by econ interest, who were policy informants to everybody in Congress, they informed every law to the degree that they should. They themselves were very good judges of where the current research is about all our different, that kind of thing. Uh, I'm just reiterating what both of you already said. That doesn't seem to change the fact that they're on, on the receptive side. It doesn't change the fact that our own science seems to tell us we as human beings are hardwired not to be very receptive to any of that. And in fact, in many ways, to be unreceptive to it and to fight it. And I mean, unless science develops a drug to brainwash us all to be different than that. I'm sure somebody's working There's on that. Book currently, book. probably. <laughs> uh, that doesn't change. And I'm, I'm saying that's partially due to the fact that public policy is a matter of public debate. And as long as that's a matter of public debate and science is a part of that policy, then so is the scientific claim itself a matter of public debate. And now I have to decide. Do I want to live in a society where people just know they just have to accept scientific consensus? It's not up to them anymore to have the freedom to say, I'm not sure I agree with that, or do I want them to have that freedom? I don't know that that's a question of even having a scientific study. I think that's a values question at this point. Do I think a person's individual liberty to be able to say, you know, I, the jury's still out for me. I don't care if 100% of scientists say this. I'm not sure I want this for my child or something like that. Well, I mean, do I as a parent want to live in a place where I'm op it's open for me to do that or just not open for me to do that? And I mean, that's what I'm saying is like that's a conflict now between what I take to be a political value and science even operating under ideal conditions. Uh, I'm thinking, look, I'm thinking here of somebody like John Stuart Mill who thinks that um, what we need here is a completely open marketplace of ideas. I mean, what he has envisioned I'm speaking anachronistically, but what he has envisioned is exactly, ideally, what takes place in the scientific community, that strictly speaking, anybody can put forward any hypothesis they want. That's fine, as long as it's subjected to the same rigorous testing that anybody's hypothesis would be. And that's why we have peer review processes and that kind of thing. And it's good that we learn things when people have hypotheses that turn out to be false. We got, that was actually new information. Okay. Well, Mill says that's exactly why society at large, we should have free and open expression. People should be free to tout opinions that are radically unpopular. Why? Because it actually benefits in the long run and the whole to have these false opinions out there. There are means by which they are tested in discussion and debate and public discourse and in the lifestyles of those who choose to act on them. Now, if, I'm not necessarily saying Mill just has to be right, but if Mill is right, that means there's a society out there where people can just say like, yeah, well, I don't think scientists are right about this, despite the fact that maybe even 100% of them agree. And our wonderful policy uh, informant committee panel that's telling you know, Congress about all of the best science, we still have citizens who have the right to vote, 
who can say like, yeah, but I don't think they're right about that. In which case now, it's up to them to say like, so what? We don't care. And I mean, as long as that's at issue, that seems to me now a question of like, do I want science policy full go? Then I need something more authoritarian that just bypasses those people. Do I want those people to have some authority? Then I'm going to have to risk waiting a really long time in some cases to have policies that even resemble what I think would be good. Now, I'm actually more skeptical than Mill. I, I mean, Mill seems to think that just give that free for all and the truth will out. And I think he's way too Pollyanna about that. I, I, I think that maybe there's cases where it'll be an insanely long time and very false, terrible opinions will reign for a very long time, and that's terrifying. And I think that's part and parcel of, of uh, partly due to the fact that all our psychology tells us things about like in-group, out-group biases, tribalism, those kinds of things where I'm um, in some ways hardwired to not want that kind of stuff. I'm not advocating at all that we shouldn't have um, science-informed policy. That sounds great. And in lots of those cases, I don't know that I could do any better. In fact, I mean, that's part of it is why I'm, I'm skeptical about working. Look, if I'm... If there's just some phenomena out there that affects my life and I'm trying to do my best by it and I encounter this over and over and over again, I might have some success rate and it might be really terrible. Suppose I only have like a 15% rate of predicting whatever correctly and things working out for me. Somebody, an expert in the field who has all the scientific training, might do better than me. That doesn't mean they're doing awesome. That means they're doing better than me. So, I mean, if we're talking about like weather, okay? Maybe I only have like a 15% success rate of predicting when it's going to rain or not rain. If um, whoever's, I always want to say Gary England because as far as I'm concerned, there is no other. But uh, he's been retired for a while. David Payne. David Payne. If he's David, awesome. If David Payne comes along and has a 40% success rate, then yeah. I'm, I mean, it's in my rational best interest to just trust him. But notice what's interesting is that Neither of us are more likely than not to get it right, but he is more likely than me to get it right. And so, yeah, on, on those bare numbers, it's rational for me just to trust. The problem is, what's the problem? Human psychology and the fact that what I see is his 60% failure rate. And so it seems to me like he doesn't know anything. And you know what? He changes his mind too much. He says it's going to rain 40% of the time, and it rains 40% of the time. And there's these others. He's a flip-flopper is what he is. And all of a sudden, now I just think he's not reliable. Again, that's me not understanding like how the process would work. That's true. But I'm saying like, and I look, there's droves of people for whom that's never, ever going to change. They're, they're always going to be in that boat of not having the relevant expertise or the understanding of like why they should just accept that lots of times it's wrong. Lots of times it, people change their mind about this. Lots of times we go you know, 40, 50 years and then find out, oh, we've been wrong about that the whole time or something like that. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's par for the course if you're in the trade. When you're not in the trade, it looks like you guys don't know what you're doing. And then that would be what you're up against, politically speaking, when it's time to actually pass those policies. Okay, I'm done ranting. I'm done. <laughs> uh, we're about to open it up to allow for some students to ask some questions. So if you want to ask a question, I think we want you to come to this um, microphone over here before, so go ahead and make your way there. Uh, before we do that, I just want to, um, again, stir the pot a little bit, all right, because there's way too much hand-holding and kumbaya singing going on right now. So, um, uh, so let's, let's go back to this notion you had mentioned, uh, you know, how it drives you crazy when people don't think of the long-term future. You mentioned a couple of times. Uh, short-term gain versus long-term gain uh, and uh, again I'm gonna go back to in what area uh, in what areas of anyone's individual lives do we really think super long-term about this I mean I don't put money into an investment account so that my great 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 grandchildren will have some nest egg on which to live right I think maybe my children if I'm really forward-thinking I think maybe my grandchildren and that's it. Uh, I think it's almost asking too much to, of people to say you should in some way impoverish yourself now for someone you will never know or meet or so, some distant future in the, uh, that, that we don't even know about, right? And so uh, I think those kinds of things, you're almost asking the impossible of people because 
we don't think that way. And, and to, to, to try to convince people that I should in some way make a decision that's going to uh, cause me harm. And, and I'm going to come back and say, the mere fact that someone says this is going to cause me economic harm should not be discounted. What are you saying then? This has caused me the ability to buy food, clothing, and shelter for my family, right? Uh, that's economic harm. And we shouldn't discount someone's concern about being able to provide that for their family uh, by saying, yes, but a thousand years from now, you might not have a world to live in. Uh, most people don't think they'll have a world to live in in a thousand years anyway, in my opinion. And so uh, I think we have to have some balance here of recognition that, um, as Dr. Crane said, you know, the way human beings think and the way we perceive the world has to be incorporated into this. And, in, and that means, by definition, even questions relating to, to uh, issues that are purely scientific will not always, science will not always be the core of the public policy that we create about those. And, then, and again, I'm going to come back to, and it, most of the time it can't be, and not if you're going to allow people to say and do things that they want to say and do. Can I add one thing? Sure, yeah. go ahead. No, I, it's just, what's funny, so there is a, there's a pair of philosophers, uh, Julian Savalescu and Ingmar Persson, who are so sympathetic to like everything that we've said about like, of course we want scientific policy, uh, that recognize that it seems like human psychology is the obstacle. And so their proposal is to use our medical knowledge to alter humans. So what we need is, they call it moral transhumanism. We should actually be altering human psychology at this point. So easy example would be something like this. Um, if we have really good reasons to believe that things like uh, oxytocin or serotonin makes us less aggressive, more likely to cooperate, more likely to engage in pro-social behaviors, then you know what? Cities should just agree as a matter of policy, let's, that's in the tap water now. That's in the tap water now. We, people should just be drinking these things and becoming less violent um, without their even being aware of something like that. Uh, why not? I mean, in other words, if, this, if it's worth that much, then why not just change what people are. Well, some people want to say, because what if I don't want to take the drug? And now we're back to, is it up to me or not? Can I say something? You want to jump in? All right. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. I just want to get everyone all, all fired up. Um, I, I think that the psychology thing it is, is interesting because I think um, it, it does go back psychologically to our brains that, that we have an inner fish. We're, we're our little fishy brains that, they, that we develop from likes shiny stuff um, and so um, you know there is that psychology issue that, that is hardwired into us but you know it made me think when you were talking about you know people don't want to give up things today for a thousand years but I don't even think a lot of times we're talking about you know giving up like food uh, and water we're talking about giving up the jet ski like I don't want to have I want I want more and it's, which is also part of you know, shiny I like shiny stuff um, that's hardwired in there, and, and, and I don't know uh, how, we, how we get to that point where we can oversee the shiny for the thousand years, because I've looked back and done uh, 23andMe and looked at genetics and, you know, my ancestors, and I can track them back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and in my science brain, it actually does make me sad to think that, that we could do things where my ancestors won't be looking back in 100, 200, 500 years, because they won't be there, you know, because they don't, so I... I don't know how to get us to that point, but, but in a magic world, yeah. We okay, just real quick. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty quick, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so I, it doesn't have to be 1,000 years. It doesn't have to be 500 years. It, we could just look at the uh, Flint, Michigan was mentioned in the debate. It's not much of a debate, but it, we can say it, Flint, Michigan was mentioned. So Flint, Michigan, they placed their policy on an economic approach. They were going to save money by getting from the river instead of from the Great Lakes and, uh, and piping it over there. That, that water was more caustic and they had lead pipes and it leached out into their water. And then, so now because they made that decision to save a little bit of money, well, you know, maybe a million dollars, whatever, or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now they're looking at billions of dollars in restoration. And those uh, kids that drank that water, their lives have changed because lead is a neurotoxin in the body, it causes brain damage so that's uh, it should have been based on science and not so I just wanted to mention one that you know we're talking about long term and 
That's thousands of years from now. So. Five years, ten years? Yeah, yeah, very short. All right, I'll shut up. Sorry. All right, let's, All right. let's go. All right, so if there is such a consensus that they want science to be the core, but what if, say, we look back when science was the core or, like, used as a standard, like, say, with ice pick lobotomies or conversion therapy that was considered scientific and the standard for that time period? How do we know as a public when to know that pseudoscience and when to, like, agree or disagree with it? Well, that was, we had the scientific method, but we, we didn't have uh, fail safes in place, not fail safes, but uh, we, we have now the peer review process. And that's the QC, QA, quality control, quality assurance for the scientific method. Uh, yes, that was our poor understanding of that. I, I believe that now we, uh, of course, our science has advanced and we look at things more thoroughly and in depth and we, collaborate with other scientists with the peer review process to make sure we don't have things like that happening. It still happens. Uh, we have a, in the United States, whenever we develop chemicals and commerce, because this is money versus science. It's, it's at oppositions with each other. We have an innocent until proven guilty policy where we just put uh, chemicals and drugs, new drugs out to commerce without thoroughly testing these. The European Union does not have this. They have a, a precautionary principle. So we do not utilize the precautionary principle because of our market-based economy that, that uh, and money is the almighty, the dollar is the almighty deci deciding force here. I would also add that, that some of those things that you were mentioning were not necessarily, they might have been unfortunately commonplace, but they weren't necessarily governmental policy. There wasn't governmental policy that you had to go to certain types of, of conversion therapies or um, that you would have things like lobotomies. Those were still, unfortunately, personal decisions that families may make for their family members, might make for minors, might make, you know, and, and then you're getting to that point of, of allowing people to make, and still there's arguments about, you know, should, should family members be able to make that, those decisions for minor children? Um, and we're trying to form policy on, on whether parents should be allowed to make those decisions for their kids. I think right now it's, it's pretty much against, but before it was like, oh, let, let them do whatever they want. If they want to go take their kid to conversion therapy, they should let them. There wasn't overall policy or even well fact-based data to show like, no, that's, you, no, don't do that. And, and now we actually have developed policy, more policy of you, you shouldn't do that to people because there was no policy for those things. It was just allowed to happen. Um, so I, I would say that maybe there wasn't, there wasn't really, there wasn't like you have to go get a lobotomy. We just let people do what they want. And, and now we've actually, with the science, have made policies like, no, you no, know, you can't do what you want as a parent to have your kid have to go be put through that. So I would make that argument. I am going to just insert one thing here. Um, it actually depends on the government and the time place, right? Because we have had governments that those actually were, right? Uh, we don't speak very highly of those governments any longer, right? But uh, we've had governments that have said, yes, if we need to just convert people through uh, medicine in the water, we'll do that as well. We tend to not think real highly of those, uh, and generally for good reason. But uh, I, did, I did want to throw that out there, that depending on the government, uh, these things have, we have seen these things done uh, in very horrid fashions with, with very horrid outcomes, right? All right. So how many questions am I allowed to ask? One, one. <laughs> All right, so one. I'll, have to pick, <laughs> I'll have to pick one then. Um, so I guess um, just to kind of spark more debate, I guess, I'll do the more controversial vaccines. A lot of people believe that vaccines cause autism. You can find scientific things showing that there is a higher link to it and um, a lot of people don't choose not to vaccinate for religious beliefs so at what point are you saying well um you're not vaccinating your children you're a risk to others you have to vaccinate but now you're infringing on their political freedom and of religion and then um I, kind of a two-part question on that if you are requiring people to get vaccines should you even be able to charge them for them Vaccines are very costly, so now you're telling me I have to vaccinate my child, and I also have to pay a thousand dollars to vaccinate my child if I'm uninsured. All 
first off, there is no link between vaccinations and autism. That has been debunked. It's, it's a scientific fact that there is no link between the two. That's first off. Uh, second off was, I'm, I'm trying to determine what, I'm trying to remember what that was. Uh, religious, uh, maybe religious or cost. Oh, you're not in, in the United States. You don't have to uh, vaccinate your children if you don't want to. Now you're putting you're putting your child at risk, and you're putting other kids at risk that maybe don't have a vaccination if, if you don't. So it's it's pretty much I, I view it as a as a selfish as a, a selfish decision on not vaccinating your kids because one this is the it's sound science on this is the best way that we have to protect against these diseases. Now we you we can inoculate you and you won't get them and then so you choose not to you, uh, in the United States you can choose not to there's there's no uh, the government the United States government is not forcing parents to vaccinate their so parents. my question on that um, the debate is whether science should become policy for the government so it's like should people are dying so vaccinate? should it be law this, that we make you vaccinate it's, uh, that was kind of more my question okay uh, if you base it purely on science then yes, we should. But we don't base our decisions purely on science. We also base them on ethics and economics. So ethical uh, reasons, and this is what we were talking about earlier as well with, uh, they didn't say eugenics, but uh, eugenics has not become as, as popular after WW2. So uh, that's the reason for that. So uh, ethical, uh, so human rights. We have expanded our ethical consideration over history and in the United States and developed countries particularly. So now we don't just care about us, we also care about other people, and we also care about nature, we care about animals, and we care about the environment as well. That's the expansion of ethical consideration. Did that answer your question? Okay. Um, so there's been talk of uh, lead and environmental degradation uh, and economic interest blocking the actual progress of society. Uh, to name that economic interest, that is capitalism and the unbridled pursuit of uh, profit and capital. Uh, profit in leaded gasoline kept it around. Profit in environmental degradation allows it to continue, uh, including oil and related industries. So I want to ask uh, what concrete solutions exist to, curtails, uh, to curtail capitalism's corruption of public policy, uh, not just pertaining to the environment, but also health care and other areas that can be properly analyzed by science? I'll answer real quick. It used to be the EPA. But then we have Scott Pruitt that is in charge of the EPA now, the director, and so it's no longer that way. Uh, I was going to kind of say there's not, I can't point to a concrete way right now that, which, which as a scientist is, is frustrating. I would say there's probably a lot of frustration among scientists regarding kind of the erosion of, of science-based decisions in lieu of economic gain. Um, but I think it also kind of goes back to that, that, you know, if a capitalistic society says, no, we've got to, to you want to live? You want, you want to have that, that vaccine? Okay, maybe this one's not as deadly, but it's going to cost you more because if it's in development. And, you know, well, we're going to have to pay for it if you want to live. Uh, definitely the ethics question, we're not there yet. It, but It's a balance act. It, we have laws. We have environmental laws, environmental policy that is in place to protect against capitalist pursuits of uh, damage for the to the environment we have the clean water act we have the clean air act and we are a much better nation a wealthier nation because of those two we have uh, natural we have the natural resource conservation service that uh, provides help to industry and to mainly farmers the the agriculture industry uh, so that there's there's laws in place to protect against that now like I said, it's always a balancing act. The, the oil and gas industry, they're exempt from, uh, from giving out their information of what is in their fracking fluids. And because they, there was a law that was passed that allows them this exemption. And so they don't have to, they don't abide by the, the, the Clean Water Act and uh, the, there's loopholes in there for industry. So we have to be careful. And once again, I want to be an advocate of science-based policy to drive our decisions. Okay. I'm going to, 
before we go to our next one, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here. Uh, I guess I'll be the lone defender of capitalism. What does <laughs> What is the primary need for all of these solutions that we've been talking about? Wealth. What generates wealth more than any other system in the world? Capitalism. There's no doubt about it. We have hundreds of years of history to evaluate that and to demonstrate that. When did we become interested in the environment? When we had the resources to do something yes. about it. Uh, and so uh, it's not capitalism. When we talk about laws protecting <laughs> industries from having to reveal things that should be public information we're not talking about capitalism we're there we're talking about state capitalism or crony capitalism in which uh, you are using the power of government to benefit a specific entity for some reason or like another like some might say we have in Oklahoma <laughs> right so um, but but I'm gonna I'm gonna stand here or, or sit here and, and just speak out a word and say uh, you don't have capitalism you don't get all, any of this done and, and that's just the reality of it. It's the thing that produces the resources that we can tax and then spend to research environmental issues, to research health issues, to come up with solutions. I guess I'm, can I say that I'm, I'm also, even granting all the criticisms of a capitalistic system, I'm not sure that that exonerates other systems from being able to be equally as corrupt in ways that just take another form but get us in the same kinds of problems. All right, next question. Okay, I'm nervous now. <laughs> um, I'm not good at this, but I want an extra credit now. <laughs> uh, what, I, what I can't understand is tobacco. We all, it's, it's a proven fact that tobacco causes cancer, emphysema, and even death. And all the billions of dollars that insurance pays, government pays um, for the treatment of cancer. Uh, why can't we just stop making, you know, letting those companies make the tobacco and sell it in the United States or all, or all over the world. And uh, if we did, look how much money we could have for the treatment of our environment and the treatment of cancer. And I just have been trying to understand that for a long time. Why do you sell something that is a proven fact that it causes death? All right, I'm going to be real uh, uh, because we allow people to sell lots of things that are proven to cause death, right? We just mentioned automobiles are proven to cause a certain amount of death. Um, bathtubs cause a certain amount of deaths each year. Uh, people sticking their hair dryers in the bathtub also causes a certain amount of death every year. Uh, we allow lots of people to make decisions that probably aren't pretty bright. Uh, that's not scientific. We don't do that on the basis of science because we know sticking a blow dryer into a pool of puddle of water is a pretty bad idea, right? Scientific science tells us that. Uh, but, uh, but we allow people to make bad decisions, and, and I'm going to argue we're better off for it than we would be not. Um, uh, quick, quick question, and I don't know the answer to this, so I'm throwing it out here. If anybody, are there more alcohol-related deaths or more no. cigarette-related deaths cigarette. each year? Do we know that? Uh, alcohol. Do we, do we know that? Alco alcohol. Do we know that for? If, if 100% cigarettes, I can actually pull it up right now. I used to work for an anti-smoking company, uh -huh. and that was funded by smoking when they got started. Right. So we're, we're also including things like drunk driving okay. and those yeah. and alcohol-related crimes? Yeah. Okay. Obesity is number one. So maybe we should be outlawing well, obesity because well, that also with, provides sorry, a certain amount of death. With right? alcohol, if you start drinking in your 20s, time you're 70 your liver is going to shut down on you and you'll need uh, liver transplants and de and it does cause death in most people in their 70s i think one of the things and we're, we're kind of talking about you know as far as policies and and improvements in policies is um kind of like the your your rights end where my rights begin kind of thing mm -hmm. and i think we have actually made gains in like um at our campus is a, a breathe friendly or breathe for what to smoke, smoke free. There we go. Right. <laughs> breathe. Right. Yeah, you know, where, where we're trying, you know, we, we recognize. So much nicer. <laughs> 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 um, but but that idea that that is something bad. And once there started to be this preponderance of evidence that secondhand smoke could harm 
you know, the person right next to you, they didn't have to smoke and they could get, you know, cancer and all those problems too. We did start to make policies against, um, you know, you can kill yourself, but you can't kill your kids or your neighbor or your, and, and so you can't smoke in restaurants, smoke in restaurants right, anymore. And, and the same thing with like, with alcohol as well you know, there's drunk driving laws and things like that. It's like, if you want to get drunk, fine, but you can't. <laughs> it shouldn't impact somebody else's rights and so i think a lot of the policies usually are more are group related and and try to stay out of of individuals if you want to make a bad decision for yourself okay and, and but but companies are definitely going to manipulate that as far as they can um you know push that that envelope of like well look it's attractive and it's fun and oh gosh in the 50s it's like you want to lose some weight <laughs> smoke a cigarette this will make your you'll have a smaller baby so it won't uh it won't stretch you out as much yeah, <laughs> like, doctors, yeah. Right. This yeah doctors right. yeah. so at least we've gotten past that a little bit but but yeah i mean it's it's definitely a health issue but but like james was saying it's got to let individuals make their own right or their own kind of decisions as long as it doesn't start impacting others i think science has helped to why, make some improvements there we have many of these regulations about where smoking can occur and those types of things but we have a new dollar a, a dollar and a half tax coming on <laughs> yes. for the cigarettes the sin tax so right, it's right. It should, so uh, that. discourage people from i don't know what do they cost now 650 a pack or something something like that or they're it's going to yeah. Yeah. Depends on where you buy. i guess yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right let's okay. go we got, okay thank we're, you we're getting close to our time limit but uh, let's go ahead and see if we can get so this last view i'm kind of the black sheep as i'm finishing my associates in petroleum engineering and geophysics so this is the geo guy right here i appreciate that did you come up to the mic oh sorry yeah, yeah. um did you guys hear that first part yeah yes. okay yeah. that being said I, I i think we do have some money that we could spare beside like and draw from the military into other places of science um, I think it's somewhere between 65 and 85 percent of all the government funding goes to the military. Um, now, that being said, on that notion, what's your opinion on liquid fluoride thorium reactors as an alternate source, and this kind of addresses your question as well, as an alternate source of energy that we can actually utilize as clean as well, away from coal? Hunt. The environmental yeah, scientist. All right. You're a... Uh, 30 seconds or less. My, my opinion is we can, we should pursue the, the technology, but we per, should pursue it cautiously because mm -hmm. we need to look at all avenues because we are a, uh, a very energy con consuming country here and we consume a whole lot of it. It's better than burning coal. We're phasing out coal because of the fracking industry mm -hmm. and now we have plenty of natural gas. And so natural gas is the cleanest burning of the fossil fuels. So yeah, I, I'm not a, a, a I'm not against it, so I, I think we should still pursue the technology. It's uh, there. There's some some benefits on that as opposed to uh, the um, the traditional nuclear reactors that we have here in the United yeah, States. Yeah, yeah. So okay. Um, and on my second part on that is, since we know that it's about a thousand times more abundant as far as like what it can yield as far mm -hmm. as energy effects, and it's cleaner. Would you? I mean. What kind of lobbying needs to go in for that? I mean, because China's already starting these, so. It's, I mean, it's the, capitalism. Yeah, it, there's there's going to have to be some dollars behind it. So, uh, where is that coming from? Uh, if the, the the oil, you know, the the half life of oil is is the peak of oil is coming up, in the in the very near future, uh, possibly even in my lifetime, and I'm an old man. But uh, it's so they're going to have to explore other avenues as well, and so maybe they can get behind it, and they have a lot. Of, they have deep pockets and can can lobby for it. So okay. right. possibly, but um, yeah, there there needs to be a lot more research with Energy it. Companies. Okay. okay. Thank you. Next. I just want to throw a couple things out there first. Um, I don't think capitalism isn't the only system to send somebody into space nor increase life expectancy, and I don't think wealth equates to health or information literacy. And also on that, uh, on overpopulation, I believe that's more of a problem of resource allocation and distribution. But I want to speak on uh, China, which he mentioned. I noticed, you know, over the years, we noticed the smog get really bad and people started wearing masks and now they're developing new technologies in order to get the smog out of the air. And I think that's um, where the question of where does science enter into policy might be applied, you know. And especially in our state where oil has bought out the government and they like OERB teaches in our very classrooms to be pro-fossil fuel. 
I think a lot of the questions with the businesses comes down to is it profitable to be better safe than sorry? And there's not a clear question in there, but maybe you can speak on that. I think we were kind of talking about reaching the, the peak of oil and stuff. A lot of those energy companies probably will start to shift. You know, they're, is Exxon going to go away? Probably not. They'll start doing something else, you know. And, and I think um, it's about reaching that peak. You know, it's when, like, the smog is so bad that it also hurts public perception. I mean, you had, like, the Olympics there, and, and so there was all these concerns about how bad the pollution was in China. Once once the public perception gets bad enough, then then, then you start to see motion on it as well. Um, I, I think it's interesting, a couple, about 2000, uh, China had a, a SARS. We didn't know what severe acute respiratory syndrome was yet. Uh, it kind of developed there. They kept the first 300 cases under the rug, <laughs> like not letting anybody know. And, and then it wasn't until people started, it started spreading, it's a probably about a month before it started spreading out that they were finally like, we've got a problem <laughs> um, with this infectious agent. And, uh, but it was because they knew they were getting to that perception, that public perception problem, so, or that, that, that tipping point. So I think some of it is, is also public perception, which goes back to the human aspect of it, is, is when, when the public perception starts to turn, then you start to get more investment um, in some of those technologies. Just real quick, China is a good example of a country that has placed most of their policy on economics and, and ignored the science behind it, also ignored the ethics behind it. And their air quality is off the charts of like horrible. It's, it's, uh, we don't even register, we don't even have a number for it here. It's, uh, it's, it maxes out on a very common basis there. They're going to solar power, and I just read an article and talks about how there's a, a dimming because of all the air pollution and they're not getting enough energy from their, their solar panels. So the reason why that there's, uh, the, they do have technology there but they're not putting that in to clean it up, they're starting to a little bit now and that's because the public has, uh, they're, they're posting things on mass media. That's our technology, our cell phone helping that us and that's driving the government to, to do something about it to industry, to kind of force their hand about it. So, so that's one of the issues that's, that's going on there. All right. Okay, last question. Miss, I, uh, I'm sorry, I came late to the party. I didn't get your name. Hurst. Hurst? It's very nice to meet you. Thank you very much. You mentioned something that's a little bit concerning earlier regarding vaccines. If they want the good vaccines, they gotta pay for the good vaccines that might suggest there's other kinds of vaccines out there. Look, I recognize that we have a very delicate economic system. There's very big people who make very big decisions who have to keep money on the table for everybody else and power has to be distributed equally. However, there's uh, something um, kind of disturbing that I'm noticing that we are enforcing vaccinations that contain ingredients like formaldehyde, which is a uh, class one carcinogen and a neurotoxin, ones that contain aluminum, also a neurotoxin. Thimos, uh, thimosol contains mercury in Triton uh, X100, that, that one right there. And we still are provocating meat products when we have so much vegetable product to give to the public that we are using to feed the animals, which recently, I'm sure to a lot of people rolling their eyes, became listed as a class one carcinogen. For anyone who doesn't know out there, a class one carcinogen is something that is listed to more directly give you cancer. Now, I'd like to take a second to recognize that I do recognize that the Holocaust did happen, that there were millions of Jews and citizens who were deemed unacceptable, who were killed and forced to do horrible inhuman acts against their will. We recognize another power to that effect, sort of at this day, 
and we call it North Korea, and we allow it to exist. Why we do, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a necessary evil. I don't know. There's a thing, there's a study out there that said if they were to uncover how many deaths had gone on in North Korea, it would massively outweigh what had gone on in the Holocaust. Which brings me to my last point, phenol, which was used in the Auschwitz to gas millions and millions of Jews and is now an ingredient in vaccines. Could you address that for me? Yeah, I'll definitely. Um, it, with the vaccines and, and kind of from experience also, uh, when I kind of mentioned, you know, good vaccines, you have to pay more. Um, I, I was specifically thinking in my mind about my, um, my eldest son now, when he was about 12, the HPV vaccine came out. And since it was new and HPV doesn't kill as many people as, as maybe uh, measles and things like that, then it wasn't one of the things that insurance companies paid for. They, the insurance companies usually will pay for those that are deemed more like you're going to immediately die from this. But if I wanted to get the HPV vaccine for my son, then I was going to have to pay for that one. And I paid for it because I thought, you know, his health, the health of his wife later, um, that, that was an acceptable risk to me. So it's kind of like where the vaccine is in development, how necessary it seems or is deemed, then you may or may not have to pay for it. Um, and, and there are different compounds in, in vaccines that they sound sciencey and they sound scares, uh, scary. And we think about mercury and mercury is bad. But not all mercury is the same. There's more inert forms and more active forms and you're exposed to mercury all the time. So it kind of gets back to the parts per million thing that Dan was talking about earlier. Um, that, that you know, we hear, oh, there's mercury in the vaccine, it must be bad, but it's an inert form of mercury. You're gonna eat more in a tuna fish sandwich um, than, than you are going to get from a vaccine. And, and actually, a lot of that was removed because of public perception. We're talking about public perception drive stuff. Um, but then public perception was like, well, it must have been bad because you removed it. It's like, uh, actually, it didn't do anything, but people were scared of it. So we said, we'll remove it. Um, and phenol, um, actually, phenol is also 3% in chloroseptic spray, um, which is something you spray in your mouth 100%, you inject it into somebody or put it as a gas. It will definitely kill you. But it gets back to that acceptable levels and parts per million, and, and anything can be bad for you um, in 100%. I can, I can kill myself with water, as I was going to say. I can kill myself with water. I can sit there and drink and drink and drink and drink. And, and actually, um, an unfortunate case uh, that happened a couple of years ago, you know, and, okay, I'm going to date myself. I'm old. Um, you know when the Wii systems first came out? And there was like a big thing, and they actually, in L.A., they had a, um, a contest on a, a a radio station who can hold their Wii to win a Wii for Christmas and all these nurses and doctors called in like you're gonna kill someone um, and they're like oh no it's funny ha 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 the the they came down to two ladies and as they didn't pee they would have to drink more and more water and the last one to pee got the game system um, so the lady who broke first and actually ended up peeing uh, did not get the game system and then developed water toxicity and died. For, so for Christmas, she, her kids didn't get a Wii and their mom died. So that was really bad. And that was from water. I mean, that's water. Um, so, so I think there does, you know, and it, there are public perception issues and, and things with, with chemicals, but it kind of gets to what Dan was saying earlier. Um, you know, what is that? That parts per million. We, we get exposed to stuff all, all the time. We hear terms like mercury and we're scared of them. Or we hear terms like phenol and we're scared of them. Anything in too much is bad for you. Um, but these are in such small, small percentages that they, you're exposed to them already anyway. Um, it's not going to cause, then they don't cause. There's no evidence that shows that they cause. And you, people go, well, there's no evidence that doesn't show that they don't cause it. But you can't prove a negative. You can't prove a negative. So, I mean, there is, there's lots of research that shows that, that those are, in the levels they've been used, completely safe. At least for vaccines. I'll, I'll take the vaccine question. Anyone else Good. want the rest of it? No, so. I think. Is, did you want to add anything to that? North Korea part. The, you want the North Korea part? Yeah, okay. yeah. I, I kind of want the North Korea part. All right. So, you asked why we don't go in there. What's to stop us from becoming North Korea if we're enforcing policies like this? Oh, okay. I got confused on the question. I did too. I, uh, I, I thought you. I thought it I was apologize. like, why don't we go in there? And I was going to address that. So. Got a little. Uh, Okay. So disregard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
we uh, we have hit and exceeded our, our stated time limit, so we're going to have to wrap this up. Oh. Uh, I do want to point out uh, to folks who are here, uh, if you look at this slide up here, uh, this will direct you to a survey we'd love for you to take. This is uh, administered by one of the, the institutions that help provide funds for this. Uh, they love it to get feedback, to, and they give us the feedback so we can continuously improve the program. So uh, if you take the time to do that, uh, if you're in one of my classes, you'll get a, a direct link to that survey as well. Uh, but uh, please take the time to fill that out. It really helps us uh, improve these programs, and it keeps uh, the people who have been gracious enough to fund us happy as well. So we want to keep that up also. I, I want to have one thing. I, I want to thank all the students for asking the questions. Those were excellent questions. Yes. And it shows that you guys were really paying attention and, and, and really understanding the, these, these issues. So thank you all for doing that. Funding for Great Debates, Power, Politics, and People, provided by yes. the John right. Templeton Foundation right. through a grant from the Institute for Humane Studies. Facilities provided by Rose State College. I think there actually were a few Center. cases where they would, because they went off and fought. You're graduating. Your parents are proud. You're relieved. But now what? Where are you going? How about a college where you won't get overwhelmed and still get the full college experience? Great. Let's start at Rose State. Rose State starts you out with a choice from more than 60 degrees and certificate programs. And Rose State offers compelling value in its two-year degrees. Consider the Rose State graduate feedback in a recent survey. 95% of recent Rose State graduates are employed. 95% would recommend Rose State to a friend. And 97% would get their associate degree if they had to do it all over again. But don't worry. Students at Rose State are so much more than just a number. We'll help you along the way. With smaller class sizes, you can enjoy a hands-on academic lifestyle with a friendly, engaging, and experienced staff. With Oklahoma's first urban community college housing, you can live on campus and enjoy a bustling student life, from sports to an award-winning performing arts center. But at the end of the day, it's all about you and where you want to go. So what are you waiting for? Get started. Rose State College. Going somewhere starts here. All right, you're great.